working as it should. Perfect. Thank you, everyone, for coming tonight to the, to the WebMRD. Uh, it's a special exercise for me because I will speak in English for once. For the first time for the year, I'm speaking in English at the WebMRD. So please be, cli be kind with me. And my English is not perfect. Pretty sure for that. Uh, WebMRD, let's, let's talk about the agenda tonight. We change a little bit from people that already know the WebMRD, the order of the of the section of the WebMRD. So we'll start with an intro. I will speak about the WebMRD, what is WebMRD, who is behind the WebMRD, and who help us to create and maintain the WebMRD. Uh, once done, that's the boring part, you know. Naomi will talk about fresh fonts and fonts and the newsletters and the, um, the journey of, yeah. of <laughs> fresh fonts. Then we will talk about what's next. So what's the next WebMRD? I will announce the next WebMRD. So you can already subscribe if you want to. We have an open mic session. The open mic is the part where people can come here and talk in front of other people. Don't be afraid. It will be fine. If you're looking for people, if you're hiring, if you want to just talk about a project or whatever you want, this is the place to be. Once then, we'll play the Kahoot game. The Kahoot game is the moment where you will play with your, your phone. I will explain every rule at that moment. Don't be afraid. We have three, three? Yes, we have three gifts tonight. Yeah, we have three gifts tonight. So the first one will be able to choose between the three, the second one between two, and the last one will have the last gift, obviously. And then we have the upper time, so this is the next area we, we are, well, where we come from. But you can just networking, we can leave without staying at, the, at that moment, obviously. Let's start. So who's behind the Wormadi? Not everybody's here tonight, but myself, obviously, Kevin, welcome. Uh, Thibaut Maya, Nelson, Justine, Sasha, Asia, who is at the photography tonight. I don't know where she is. Ah, sorry. <laughs> Looking for someone in dark. Uh, Geoffroy, and maybe you one day. We are obviously always looking for people to help us. We have many roles in the association, not only organization events. For example, Sasha helping us with the Google Ads on all the stuff about communication. Nelson's writing the tweet and writing the newsletter with, with Justine. Someone like Justine sometimes talk here and sometimes do the live stream with me. So yeah, we, we have a lot of opportunities to help us. If you want to, please reach us at, at uh, contact at arbazwebmardi.ch. We can find the link on the website, obviously. And without them, there is no webmardi, so thank you, all of you. And obviously, thank you to the people who are giving money to webmardi. Uh, either one. You You're getting money? I didn't get any. Ah, no, you did not. That's why you, they don't have your name okay. on the slide. <laughs> so either one is, uh, is like an infomaniac if you want, if kind of infomaniac, more cloud sourced. Leap is an agency in Lausanne and many parts of Switzerland also. SuperEats as a silver sponsor, so giving less money, is also <laughs> an agency in Lausanne. And Bronze sponsor a school, CPNV, maybe the next speaker of the WebMRD, who knows. And Peerdrum, who is a product about searching on your own company for a very big company. You know, looking for who is the ARAT on my, on my company, you use Peerdrum to find that. Found this. So it's mostly used by Nestle or very big company where there's a lot of people. So you don't know who to reach for ARAT or stuff like that. Don't know if I explained very well. Uh, the partners of the WebMRD, we have JetBrains, who is a software agency, a uh, software company, create many ideas of software, uh, software for software developers. Infomaniac, one of the partners, they don't give money to those one, they just help us maintaining the WebMRD. They host our website, for example. And Smashing Magazine, giving us opportunities and visibilities through events of the Smashing Magazine and Smashing Conferences. Thank you to JobTrack for hosting us tonight. It's the first time we do a WebMRD here. I think they will give um, a little fresh, and they will explain better than me what they do at the end of the presentation during the open mic session. And that's it. So it's up to you now. Cool. Now me, I will, I think so. Justine will tell you, I will quit this. Uh, 
messages. Perfect. All good? Perfect. Well, cool. Thank you. And uh, have a nice talk. Yeah. Can you guys hear me? Like, is the mic working properly? Cool. Um, so let me just. Oh, yeah. Um, yeah, well, first, uh, thank you so much, guys, for coming here tonight. Um, this is nice, actually. We're a small group, so it's going to be fun. Um, my name is uh, Noemi Stoffer in French, or um, Noemi Stoffer, I guess, in English, if you're not from here. Um, but yeah, before we start, uh, I wanted to say that um, I did my best to make a presentation, you know, that is well structured and easy to understand, but um, I do not guarantee that. So, um, you know, if anything is unclear, please just raise your hand and, uh, and let me know and give me a chance to reformulate. Like, I'd, I'd rather, you know, uh, answer questions right away than just let you guys sit there confused. So I basically uh, divided tonight's presentation into three parts. First, I'm going to talk a little bit about what I did to grow the newsletter and what worked best. Um, by growing the newsletter, I, meant, I mean what I did to get, uh, to get subscribers, basically. After that, I'm going to talk a little bit about monetizing the newsletter, so how I make money out of it. And then lastly, I'm going to talk a bit about the website. Um, which I'm not sure if you guys saw, but uh, I launched a website about a month ago. The link was on the presentation. I'm glad someone saw it. It took me, I think, three years to uh, release that website. So this is what I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to tell you what happened. But before that, uh, I just wanted you know, to tell you a little bit about my story and um, what led me to start this project. So I'm actually from around here. I, I grew up in Vevey, so that's where I'm originally from. But um, my mother is Canadian, so when I was about 10 years old, we moved to Canada. We moved to Montreal. That's, sorry, I didn't label it, but that's a picture of Montreal. And um, that's where I went to school. I say that because uh, one thing that usually surprises people is I'm, I'm not a designer. Um, I actually can't design anything. That's probably why this slide deck, you know, doesn't even respect the brand guidelines. So just don't, <laughs> don't mention that to my designers, please. I hope they're not watching. Um, so I actually have a business background. Um, I did try, you know, to do something more creative with my life. I went to art school, but um, that didn't work out very well. I got kicked out. <laughs> So, I mean, I feel like I need to explain that a little bit. Um, I finished high school, you know, I was 16, and I didn't know what to do with my life. Um, had I known what graphic design was, I'm pretty sure I would have studied that, but I didn't know that was an option. So I actually enrolled into art school, and I studied fine arts, you know, like, uh, so, you know, we would do, like, painting and drawing and sculpting and that kind of stuff, but... Um, I was actually terrible at all of it, and uh, I failed like all my classes, and uh, I got kicked out, and um, I basically lost, you know, all interest in art, and uh, I just didn't really consider myself as a as a creative person, I guess. Um, well, also, you know, I was 16, and that's about the time I realized I was gay. And, uh, you know, I was just done with high school, and um, I just wanted to party. And I, I remember, like, I had older friends, and uh, we would go out, like, to gay bars. Um, I was actually underage, but I got, like, a fake ID. And uh, they would let me in. And um, so, you know, I was 16 and I could go out and, you know, I, I didn't care about school anymore. Like, I felt like, you know, I needed to party. Um, so anyway, the school got back to me and they said, like, okay, so you're kind of out of the art program, but, you know, we're going to give you a second chance. If you stop failing all your classes, you know, you can study something else, but just not in the art department. 
So I checked, you know, the, the pro, like the list of programs that they had at the school, and uh, there was one that was called uh, business management. <laughs> and what I found appealing about it is that it mentioned that, you know, out of the things you could do after that program, which was three years, was to start your own company. And, you know, it said you could be your own boss, and, you know, that really spoke to me. So I was like, okay, like, I'm going to give that a try. And I actually did pretty well, and uh, against any expectation, I ended up going to college. I ended up doing a bachelor in business administration at HEC Montréal. Um, and then I figured, you know, my parents were paying for my studies because they didn't want me to be a dropout. So I figured maybe I should do like a master's degree. I think my parents were just happy like I, you know, I was done with arts. Like, they were like, it's okay, you know, like she has a future. <laughs> Little did they know I was going to publish a newsletter about fonts. You know, they still don't understand what that is about. Um, so I applied to um, one of the best business schools in Europe, ESADE, which is in, uh, in Spain. Uh, yeah, I was very ambitious, you know, because uh, ESADE is actually, I think, in the top three best business schools in Europe. And, uh, well, I think I just wanted to go to Barcelona and party more, you know. And somehow I got in. Like, I don't know how I did that. And so I moved to Spain. I moved to Barcelona. So, you know, lots of partying there, too. And then um, that had to end because I ended up uh, graduating from school eventually. I graduated from college. And I started working in um, healthcare, which had nothing to do with uh, anything I did before and nothing to do with design. And um, basically, I started working at St. John de Deo, or uh, St. John of God in English, which is a massive uh, children's hospital. And I basically accepted the job because I wanted to stay in Barcelona, and I didn't find anything else. And please don't tell that to my boss, but we don't really talk anymore. <laughs> and um, at the same time, in Barcelona, they were setting up like an educational program to train um, professionals to become entrepreneurs in healthcare. And somehow I got hired to be the manager of that. And so that was my first like real job ever, uh, like my first full-time job. And you know, it sounds cool and it really was, but uh, I was actually miserable. Um, like I was working crazy hours. Uh, my boss would send me, you know, emails uh, all the weekends long. I would work on weekends. I would work on every day off, every holiday. Uh, I was really underpaid, and I felt like I was treated poorly because I was not involved in any decision making that would like directly impact my workload. So you know, I was kind of young and naive, and it was my first job, and like. I, I was eager to prove to everyone that I was very capable and I was a good manager. So what I did is, you know, I kept on accepting more work and more work and more work. And, you know, I didn't want to be that person who complains. And um, I kept on doing more and I didn't really, you know, set my own boundaries. And uh, eventually that was, you know, that was too much for me. And uh, knowing I had zero support from anyone like my boss would just put like a lot of pressure on me and you know expect me to perform like 25 24 hours a day so what do you think happened burnout only one year into my very first job my, like you know i studied like i went through school and school and school and i finally got a job and one year after like you know i was brain dead um I was 24 years old, and I think that's probably the worst way to start your career. <laughs> um, I took six months off, and to be honest, that burnout really impacted me. Like now, it's not, like 10 years later. You know, I still deal with the consequences of that. Like I can tell my mental health remained a bit fragile. Like I cannot accept like a very heavy workload anymore. I, I get stressed out, and I'm, I'm terrible at handling stress. Ask my best friend, he knows. <laughs> um, so obviously I quit that job. And uh, after that, I, I didn't want to go back to like working a regular job. 
obviously. So, you know, I felt like I tried and that didn't work. So I uh, decided to go back to my initial ideas and be my own boss. So that's basically why I started Fresh Fonts. And this was back in uh, 2017. So I've been working on Fresh Fonts for six years now. So you might wonder, what the hell is Fresh Fonts? Well, does anybody here reads the newsletter? Cool, only one person? No, two. OK, so I feel like for all of you guys, I'm going to have to explain what it is. So Fresh Fonts is you know, an email newsletter that you can sign up to. And then once a month, you get an email from me. Um, in the newsletter, I share new typefaces that were released recently. Do you guys know what typefaces are? Raise your hand. OK, not everybody knows what typefaces are. OK, should I explain that? Um, help. So typeface, well, let me show you one. This is like, you, you can read text new spring releases, right? This is basically a typeface, meaning it's the design of letters. So there are basically designers who are, you know, are paid to design all the letters in the alphabet. And all that together uh, can be used by other designers on website or in any you know, printed material or anything. So basically, um, do you guys know Helvetica? Yeah. It's not that font. Yeah, OK, so the, the, there's a slight difference between the two. I used both words to say the same thing. Although, technically, typeface refers to the design, like the design of the letters, and font refers to the, like the digital file. Like you install a font, but then you, you, uh, you use a typeface in the project. But you guys don't need to worry about that, OK? <laughs> like, I, because I know, like, my mom still has no idea what it is, and I've explained 300 times, so I know this is, like, a bit geeky and, and you just need to know that what I share in the newsletter you know, are fonts or typefaces. And that's what you know, designers who are interested into that for their work look at. The newsletter is free. And I try to share as much as possible the work of independent type designers, which makes sense because you know, being self-employed is, is important to me, given how treat, like, badly I was treated in the corporate world. Um, so today, the newsletter has almost 22,000 subscribers. Where are these guys from? Um, top origin, the US accounts for a big chunk of them, probably around like 15 to 20 percent. Um, another big chunk comes from all the biggest countries in Europe, so Germany, France, and the UK. So together, that's probably 60 percent of my readership, and the rest is just like scattered all over the world. Open rate, 45%, which is actually huge. This means that whenever I send one email, 45% uh, of those 22,000 people will open it and read it. So that means whenever I hit send, I know that at least 10,000 people are going to read what I wrote. And I try not to think about that because it would stress the hell out of me. <laughs> and then click rate. Um, uh, 12%, that means that basically of the 45% people who open an email, 12% of them will actually click on a link and, and you know, read through it. Is that, is that clear? OK, because you seem confused. Um, actually, those stats, open rate and click rate, might be higher in reality. The thing is, more and more today, uh, email clients block my access to those stats. It's the case, for example, of the Apple um, email app that you have like on your iPhone and other paid email services. So if you read my newsletter in like the Apple uh, email app, you're not in those stats. And yeah, that's about it. So um, now let's talk about the uh, how I got to 22,000 subscribers? Well, let me ask first, does anybody here actually publishes an email newsletter? Ah, oh, cool. What is it about? 
Uh, I was asking you. You said you were you said you were publishing a newsletter, right? Yeah. About what? Uh, it's about my book. <laughs> right. Well, maybe we can chat about that later. <laughs> I'm not sure we have. To. Anybody interested in starting a newsletter? Oh yeah, cool. So this part should be uh, interesting for you. Let's go back to the very start. Um, so the first thing I did was, you know, even before I started uh, creating the newsletter or, you know, I started looking for content to share, I did what is called a smoke test. Um, so basically, I put together like a super basic, very crappy sign-up page, no design at all. Well, that's the best design I can do, by the way. Um, so yeah, you know, crappy design, but it was actually intentional. Um, and so I just tried to explain as simple as possible what the newsletter was about. And then I shared that around on the web, like on uh, you know, forums and other resources for designer, like designer news, which seems to be dead today, but back then you know, there was traffic. And so overnight, I got like 260 people to sign up. And it felt like a lot. Um, like, um, I mean, now, when I think about it, now that I have almost 22,000 subscribers, it sounds very little, you know, it sounds like very insignificant. But actually, I think these were the most important subscribers because they basically allowed me to validate that there was interest for the newsletter that I wanted to build. So that's one of the most important things that I learned. Um, you know, if you, want, if you send a newsletter that actually adds value for the people who read it, it will grow organically, you know, because people will talk about it, they will share it. So um, it will grow through word of mouth. So I strongly advise that you do the same, that you do a smoke test as well. You know, you put together a very simple sign-up page. You don't create the product yet, you create the sign-up page. And then you share it around, see if people, you know, like sign up. Um, I would say if you get at least a few hundred people to subscribe, then you're good to go and you can start actually, you know, building the newsletter. Which sounds pretty obvious, but you know, you're not going to grow if people are not interested in what you talk about. And so if that fails and you get nobody to sign up, well, you know, that means that either people are not interested in what you want to share or there are people who are, but they're very hard to find online. So either way, my advice is, you know, just don't do it. Try to find another idea and test it again until you pass that test. And then you can actually uh, start building. So is that my best trick? Of course not. Let's talk about the real stuff now. Um, Let's talk about the most powerful thing that I did, which allowed me to get like more than 7,000 subscribers in a couple of months. You guys know those annoying pop-ups on online store that offer you like a discount if you sign up for the newsletter? Like there's so many of them. Um, this is called a lead magnet. So a lead magnet is basically what you get in exchange for signing up for a newsletter. Very often it's a discount or a free PDF or you know, it can be a lot of things. So I wanted to experiment with that and see if, you know, if I offered something for free, it would boost, you know, the signups. So I started wondering, you know, what can I actually offer to people who like typefaces? And that was pretty obvious, a typeface. So I hired a type design studio in Paris called Pizza Typeface to create a typeface just for me. It looks like this, actually. You can see that the letters are different from the previous typefaces, in the, in, right? I'm educating you on, on fonts. So it's called uh, Gangster Grotesque, which is, uh, actually it's me who named the font. And um, I'm not sure it was a great name, but uh, actually people remember it. Like I just, I don't know, I just woke up one day and I, I decided I was feeling gangster and I thought that was a great name. <laughs> anyway, so this typeface is my lead magnet, meaning, um, I give it for free to people who sign up for the newsletter. Um, and I did a website for it. This is the latest version. Very simple website. Uh, it shows the, the typeface in two details and it basically tells you you can subscribe for the newsletter and get the typeface for free. 
And I shared that website around. Um, I shared it like uh, on Behance, on Sidebar, and other you know places for design online. And as a result, it got featured on Smashing Magazine, which is a proud partner of a uh, supporter of Web Mardi. And it got featured in other newsletters that were like that are way bigger than mine, like Dance Discovery and the Type 12 newsletter that I'm guessing not all of you know, but um, that's okay. So as you can imagine, it just brought me a ton of traffic and a ton of signups. And still today, Gangster Grotesque, the typeface, gets downloaded about 20 times every day. So that gives me 20 new subscribers every day. So I think it was a really good investment. So here's my second growth tip for you. You know, find a lead magnet that is valuable for people that want to sign up for your newsletter. And um, I mean, it doesn't have to be expensive, but it has to be interesting for your readers and related to the kind of content that you want to share with them. So that's basically it for growth. Now I'm going to talk a little bit about how I make money. Hola, ¿cómo está? Merci. Um, yeah, I'm going to go pretty straight to the point. Um, but I'm going to be here for beers after. So, you know, if you missed the detail, just uh, let's have a chat. I speak French too, by the way. Um, so the first thing I experimented with to get money was affiliate programs. Um, you know, um, so I would basically put links in my newsletter that would, you know, uh, take people to a specific platform, and if they would buy something there, I would get a commission. I think the most money I made in a month, thanks to that, was like maybe $150, US dollars. But then I realized that it started like affecting the content of the newsletter because I got biased in the sense that instead of sharing something that I thought was interesting, I would share something else that was less interesting, but I would share it because I knew if people buy it, I would make money. So because of that, um, it affected the quality of the newsletter, so I just discontinued affiliate programs. And then um, advertising came around. Actually, it came naturally. Um, by advertising, I mean, you know, people wanted to pay me to put an ad in my newsletter, obviously. And it happened naturally. Like one day someone emailed me and asked me like, do you sell ads? And I was like, yeah, sure. But I didn't, you know? So I was just Googling like, how do you price an ad in a newsletter? <laughs> and um, it worked. I think that guy booked like three ads from the start. And I was like, wow, you know? And um, so I did include ads in the newsletter for a while. Here's an example. Um, yeah, that's basically that. Um, I, I did find out how to price an ad. Um, a good rule of thumb is to charge uh, 40 USD per thousand subscribers you have, meaning you have a thousand subscribers, you can charge $40. You have 2,000, you can charge $80 and so on. The problem with that is that ads don't scale. So what do I mean by that? Um, the more subscribers you have, the more you can charge, obviously, for an ad. The thing is, there's a limit to that. Like, at some point, you will hit a maximum price that advertisers are willing to pay, and that will be it. Like, you, you, you won't be able to charge more, and you won't be able to make more money. So because of that, I figured, you know, advertising wasn't the best way, and I discontinued ads in the newsletter. And instead, I started considering having like a paid membership, meaning making people pay for the newsletter. Um, I liked the idea because it had way more potential for revenue, meaning I can have like an almost unlimited amount of people paying for my newsletter without working more. You know, like I, I create one issue of the newsletter, I send it, and if three million people want to pay for it, then good for me. 
Um, and also, what I liked was that, you know, if it's a paid subscription and it's billed monthly, means I get uh, MRR, you know, monthly recurring revenue. Meaning I get, a mo like I get the same amount of money every month, so it's kind of a stable income, a bit like having a salary. So I had a bit of a make it or break it moment, and I introduced a paid version. Now it's getting more and more common with services like Substack, but back then, you know, it was kind of a big move, and I remember being a bit scared of it. But what convinced me is that I really wanted to know if people were willing to pay for what I was doing, meaning, you know, if nobody wants to pay for it, then they don't value enough, and does it make sense that I spend so much time on this, you know? And so what happened? I introduced, in addition to the free version of the newsletter, which is once a month, people who were paying would get, you know, two issues with extra content. And um, what happened? I introduced that paid version in July uh, 2019, so four years, four years from now. And I initially got 146 members. That's me trying to make, you know, nice slides, but again, I'm not very good at it. So that was about 1% of my readers, which was not mind blowing, but you know, um, it was fair and it remained pretty stable through the end of the year. Um, and you know, the most I ever charged for an ad was $400, and now with the paid membership, I had 146 people paying $4, so I was making already 600 a month. So to me, it just confirmed, yeah, ads are gone, you know, I'm just gonna focus on the membership. Since then, it has grown a lot. Today, what people get when they become a member is a free typeface. Uh, here's an example. Um, of a typeface, it's called Mint Protesque, um, that we gave uh, not long ago. And the cool thing is, it's actually, a, people pay, and it's a surprise what they get every month. Like, me and my co-creator decide the font fam, like the typeface that members get. Um, and people pay almost $15 for that, which I think is not enough. And that was my biggest mistake, for sure in this adventure. Um, I started the price too low, it was only $4, and then I kept adding things, but I only increased the price of very, very little, so it kind of remained too little, and eventually that became a problem because I was not making enough money to cover the costs. And you know, I've been to business school and I know that's not a good thing. So, I had another make it or break it moment, and I was like, I need this project to be sustainable financially or I'm just gonna drop it and you know, find something else to do with my life. And um, doing the math, I realized that I needed to double the price to make it work. And that's what I did. So I basically sent an email to all the people paying and I said, I'm sorry, but like, well, I didn't say it like that, but now you're gonna pay more than double. So what do you think happened? Like, how do you take it if someone just, you know, emails you, yeah, now you're gonna pay the double. Imagine if Netflix was to do that. <laughs> um, so how did people take it? Yeah, I mean, I was very honest about it. Like, I explained the situation, you know, like, it's not sustainable and so on. And of course, I told them, if you're not happy, you can cancel, you know. And um, actually, I got an overwhelming response. Uh, about 80% of the people who were paying stayed. Some of them emailed me, you know, saying, I really like this project and I love like the typeface that I get and I, I understand that it was too cheap and I'm really happy to pay 15 bucks for it. And yeah, that was a really beautiful moment, you know, because I had been struggling financially for years building this, trying to bootstrap a business and then people actually realized that there was value to it and they really wanted to support me and it really meant a lot. And so, to conclude about money, today, well, before I launched a website, so that was a month ago, I had 207 pe like members, paying customers, 
uh, generating almost uh, three, well, a bit more than 3,000 USD a month. That money is not all for me. I pay about 30% of it to uh, the designers who give me the typeface that I in turn sell to my members. So I'm left with about 2,000 uh, USD in profit, which is not huge, but you know, it's what we call ramen profitability, meaning it pays for my rent and my health insurance and uh, other important things. <laughs> But, you know, I can't really live from 2,000 USD in Switzerland. Had I stayed in Spain, it would be a different story, but I, I moved back here a year ago, and uh, yeah, also, uh, that's another struggle. On est où dans les temps? Are you guys still uh, following me, or are you guys dead? Yeah? Can you give me 10 minutes to talk about the website? Cool, let's do it. So, as I told you, it took me three years to release a website. So what happened? Well, at first, I actually didn't have a website. The tool that I was using to send a newsletter had like this built-in website um, that allowed people to sign up. So this is what I used for like four years. Um, but, you know, obviously I, I wanted to do like a proper website with like a proper branding and everything at some point. So I hired a team of designers to do that. And uh, I hired them to do the visual identity and the design of the email and the website. And they did the brand identity, which is really cool. Well, I like it. And as I said, I'm not using it in the slide deck, so we'll see what happens. And they also designed uh, the email. Thing is, I realized afterwards that the designers didn't know how to code emails. And I think if like emails are actually really specific to code and a you know kind of a headache. So it was a really nice design, but then it was a complete headache to implement. Um, I found a developer who was uh, crazy enough to do it. So this is the current email, like design of the newsletter. This is like, those are like screenshots from what I see when I send the newsletter to myself. So it does look pretty good. Um, but then if you open it in Gmail, it looks freaking awful. You know, those are not the right fonts, uh, especially if you have dark mode enabled. So that kind of sucks because I need to figure out like how to redesign it and uh, to code it again so that it looks solid on every email service, especially that Gmail is like the most common email service, meaning half of my audience doesn't even get the design that I paid for. So yeah, big learning, you know, make sure that kind of, you kind of talk to an email developer at some point in the process. Um, they did design the website too, just the design. They didn't code it. And all that work, the design work, you know, the identity, the, the newsletter, and the website was done at the beginning of 2020. So like, yeah, three years ago. And then I, I uh, only launched the website last month. So what happened in those three years, I was not partying. For once, I was actually stuck at home. The pandemic hit. I was in Barcelona back then, and uh, it was very surreal. Like, we were in strict lockdown for two months. We could not even go around, like, outside to walk around the block. There was nobody in the street, which, you know, Barcelona is very touristic. They are full of tourists, like, every day of the year. For me to see that, it was, uh, I don't know, it felt like we were in The Last of Us. And um, I mean, my revenue started going down and you know, it was a moment where there was a lot of uncertainty in the air. So I pushed back the development of the website because it was a large expense and I, it didn't feel like the moment to put all my money into a website, you know, when I couldn't even like breathe air from outside. And so one year later when things calmed down, I got back to the friend, well, the person I knew that had agreed to, the developer who had agreed to do the website. 
And he told me, oh yeah, but you know, I, I've changed my price, now it's gonna be the double. And maybe he thought because I'd done that, I would say, yeah, sure. But I was like, what? Like, no, like, nothing changed. Like, the scope of the project didn't change. Like, why are you doubling the price? It didn't make sense to me. And I think this was a really big red flag, but I didn't see it, and I really should have. Like, I chose to ignore it, and, you know, I ended up reducing the scope of the website and figuring something out and negotiating with him because I had already been waiting one year to do that website, and I really wanted to launch it, and, you know, I trusted the guy, and he already knew everything about the website, so I figured, let's just do it, and, you know, I'm not going to spend time looking for someone else. But then it ended up being a complete nightmare. So... He was not paying attention to details. He would do something half done and publish it. And then I was like, dude, like, you need to fix all those bugs. And he was like, yeah, no, I can do it later. And I was like, dude, it's published. Like, this is my brand and it's online and people see it. And it's like all, you know, like, not like, it, it, it looks terrible. And uh, then he ghosted me. So I don't know if it's because I'm really annoying as a client, maybe I am. So I had no news for like an entire month. And then certainly it resurfaced. And he told me, yeah, actually, no, like I don't have time and uh, I'm gonna drop this project. I'm not gonna finish it. Uh, he had done about half of the code at that point. And I was like, okay, that's probably a good thing because you know I'm fed up be about being ghosted. And then I told him, but you know, you're going to have to refund me something because I already paid half of the website. And for me, that was a large expense. And he was like, well, I actually did half of the work. I did half of the code, so I'm not going to refund you. And that was a lot of money for me. And you know, half of the code of a website, that has zero value. Like, good luck finding a developer who's like, yeah, I'm going to spend weeks reading the code of someone else just to add, you know, the remaining bottom part. Nobody does that. Well, no skilled developer does that. If they do, maybe that's a red flag. <laughs> so he made me lose a lot of money. And the consequence of that is <laughs> second burnout. I mean, that's not the only reason, OK? Like, I had been through the pandemic, which was years of stress. Two people in my family had passed away. Um, I was under a lot of financial stress. I also had a bike accident, like I was hit by a car and I ended up needing like, needing like a jaw and dental surgeries, which was super expensive. So altogether, you know, when that came, it was like too much. And I started to have like my anxiety just, you know, hit like record levels. So I took time off. I took um, seven months off. And during that time, I, seriously considered giving up the project. You know, I was like, hell, like, I went to college. Like, why am I busting my ass and just losing money and, you know, having ramen profitability, but, <laughs> like, I want to make a living. Um, but it made me sad because I actually really cared about this project that I'd spent, like, years building. And... I realized that I did not achieve yet what I wanted to achieve with this project. And also the idea of having a boss again really terrorized me. So I was like, you know, I, uh, I need to get my shit together and uh, I started thinking. And then I found a solution that was right behind my eyes, but I didn't see it. My co-curator, the guy who helps me pick the content of the newsletter, he's the co-founder of a good web development studio in Paris. Like, the solution was just right there, but I didn't see it. So I reached out to them, and, you know, having learned from previous experience, I was very straightforward with them. I told them, you know, this is all my money. For me, it's a big investment. I expect you to pay attention to details. I expect you to not ghost me for a month. Um, and, you know, I, yeah, I was very clear about my expectations, and we... They were super professional and they were amazing to agree to do this project, which was like the budget for them at that point was clearly not what they would have charged. So this is Jean Charles. 
with the glasses, the lead developer, he's amazing, but please don't work with him because I still need him. <laughs> um, so I'm really glad that people like that exist, you know, like they really did me a favor. And so last month we ended up uh, launching the website. So that was, yeah, about a month ago. So this is what it looks like, but you can check it out online. It's at freshfonts.io. And so what happened since then? So now, uh, roughly one month after launching the website, I saw an increase of uh, 27 new paid customers, which, you know, bringing more than uh, 400 US dollars more a month. So that's about like 13% increase in revenue, which is not huge, but I think it's pretty optimistic for the future. So, you know, talking about the future, my plan is to keep growing and get those millions of uh, members who pay for the same issue of the newsletter that I sent. And uh, we'll see how that goes. So, um, but you know, to wrap up this talk, um, if there's one thing that I'd like you to remember from tonight is uh, before you hire people, do your due diligence. Maybe they have good credentials. That doesn't mean they work well. So, you know, take the time to, uh, you know, ask other people who have worked with them, how did it go? Um, and if you see any red flags, you know, consider them. Uh, because I really wish someone had told me this a couple of years ago. It would have saved me a lot of time and a lot of money and probably a second burnout. So, yeah, thank you. That was, uh, that was it. Questions, right? Well, any questions? Ah, you do? Does that count? So I was wondering, what was your, like, the bridge between uh, business school to fonts? How did you get to the top? Yeah, actually, I worked in a studio of digital development for a little bit. Um, and I was the program manager, but I realized I hated, I hated managing stuff. Especially, like, when you're, like, linked between the client and the developer, and you get all these requests, and then you have to go see the developer and be like, so how much time do you think you're going to need to do this change? Because I need to tell the client. So I hated that. But I was very interested in what the designer was doing. I thought that was super cool. So I think that's how I realized that, yeah, I was way more into design than, well, I don't know. I guess a bit of a, I'm a mix of like business and design somehow. So it makes sense that I came up with a project that mixes both things. Does that answer your question? Yeah? <laughs> Other questions? Um. Do you actually pay for any newsletters? Sorry? Do you actually pay for any newsletters? No, I don't. <laughs> but I know I, I can recommend good paid newsletters if you're looking for some. <laughs> There's mine. No, but I mean, apart from that. Because I are you interested in launching a paid newsletter? Uh, yes, but I would not pay for the newsletters myself. OK. I, I would not pay well, I know a couple of ones you could pay for just to see how they're doing it because they're, they're doing pretty great. Then I have another question. Yeah. Do you actually ask your paid clients why they pay for the newsletter? Yeah, I do. Yeah. What are the answers? Well, I ask, I mean, everybody says the same thing. So basically, it goes through kind of a funnel. Like, people sign up for the newsletter and then they read the newsletter and then after a while, you know, they see that it's consistent and it's good quality, and then they see one typeface that they really like, and so they will become a paid customer to get that one. So I know that what influenced the conversion is the typeface that I sell to them every month, really. And 
luckily for me, they stay. Like the, um, what is it called? Like the retention rate is really high. Um, so yeah, that's basically how my business works. But the goal of the website is for people to sign up for the newsletter, like not to become a paid customer right away. First, it's like they kind of go through this process of discovering the work that I do and enjoying it. And then at some point, they're like, oh, this is cool, and this is good, and I want to support it. So it's kind of a two-step process, if you want. There's another question. Yeah. Attends, ils vont passer le micro. Uh, sorry, I didn't say anything. Uh, so, sorry, so um, I'm curious, how do you still advertise the newsletter? Because you mentioned uh, some initial uh, growth hacks uh, as you tried, and I wonder what is your main channel of distribution to, to basically find new people. Now, how do I promote the newsletter? That's, that's your question, right? Well, to be honest, I don't really promote it that much anymore. Um, I have a pretty big readership now. Um, so that's the reason why like the number of subscriber hasn't kept growing because I kind of stopped promoting it. So if I want to keep growing, I need to build another campaign and you know like actively start growing the newsletter. I think it's a flaw in my strategy actually. Um, and if you don't want to do that, Sorry, the cool. No, it's not. It's not. I was talking uh, with a friend uh, and I realized because she's all about SEO. She loves writing like blog posts. She spent like years writing so many blog posts and she has like 30,000 subscribers on her newsletter now. And I'm like, I have done nothing of that and I have almost the same. So my approach is way more lazy. Um, but the thing is, I hit every now and then like kind of a bump where I'm not growing anymore. Whereas she's just growing and growing and growing because she has so much content, so it keeps attracting people and she's like growing on her own. Um, so we'll see what happens. Um, if I want to get more people, I'm going to have to think about a campaign and maybe do another typeface and you know, figure out how I want to grow again. So bottom line, I'm not doing much <laughs> right now. I'm just focusing on the people who pay for it and try to do good, you know, good things for them. And there was, uh, now it's your question. I decided that. Uh, yeah. Raise your hand. Alors, je vais poser ma question en français. Mm -hmm. Je me demandais, est-ce que vous aviez vu une évolution euh, par, du nombre de euh, membres euh, à la newsletter par rapport à la, à la qualité du contenu Alors, j'imagine que c'est de très bonne qualité, bien sûr, toutes les, um, toutes les newsletters. Well, sorry, I'm, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to answer in English. Um, did I see, like, an increase in paying people uh, in relation when I in relation with the quality of the, when the news, the quality of the newsletter was better wait wait that was that was terrible let me say that again <laughs> did I see an increase in paid customers with the quality of the newsletter going up uh, no not really actually what happened is after I doubled the price I started losing people little by little which is normal uh, I was kind of expecting that because it's kind of a big shock to, you know, ask people to pay the double, certainly. And um, really the only thing that I've noticed that really helps having more paid customers is the typeface that I get them every month. So I know, like, I can tell if a typeface is good or not. So let's say this month I'm offering a typeface that I know is not mind-blowing. So I know I'm only going to get like five, 10 new customers. The next month, if I get a really good typeface, I'm like, oh, I know, I'm going to get 20 for sure. So that's how I know a, a little bit if I'm going to get a lot of new paid customers or not. And obviously, I try to get typeface that I think are really good. But you know, I have to negotiate the prices and so on, so it's not that easy. How much of your subscriber uh, just open one time the newsletter, like to receive the lead magnet? Actually, I don't know. I, uh, honestly, I don't know. I, I, uh, I haven't checked that stat. I should. I, I, I don't know. My own question. Oh, sorry. May I? Uh, my question is about the website. So with the journey you go through, it sounds terrible. Do you think 
coding your own website with uh, you know tools that code for yourself uh, yeah. website maybe a Kickstarter website yeah will be benefit or not at all I uh, totally that's what I should have done like I should have you know stopped complaining about not being a designer and learn how to use Webflow and just you know make something nice maybe not amazing but nice but I Maybe I got you know, too passionate about things and I wanted to do like a really full-blown website. And I mean, it backfired. Like, so if I could do things differently, you know, I would uh, work on a website myself that doesn't cost a lot of money to publish. And from there, I would just, you know, I don't know, do it a little better every time instead of you know, arriving with, and having like a huge expense for the website, yeah. Yeah, it's funny because that's what you did with your newsletter. You you smoke test it, but you don't do it with your website. You yeah, you true. Final product perfect. I know. I mean, Direct. but that's a good point. Um, how much time does it take you each month or like twice a month to write the newsletter? Um, In workload, that's it. Yeah. So it's not only about writing it. Um, uh, research and everything. Yeah, there's a lot of research. So, like every time I see a, a, a good font, I save it for later. And also, my co curators send me links. So, I kind of always have like, and also, I check every day or almost because I want that when people open the email, they see a lot of stuff that they haven't seen yet anywhere. So, I want them to be really like new. Um, and then I send a newsletter usually on Thursday, so on Monday I decide the content. And I need to research every typeface and then write like a small summary of them, which takes a lot of time. So I think, and then I have to pick all the visuals and to do all the editing of the actual email. Um, so overall it's, I don't know, somewhere between 15 to 20 hours per email. That's why I send only one per month. <laughs> but then I have three weeks to chill and party. <laughs> and I had a second question. Do you use your sub subscriber also? Or did you try to use your subscribers to actually get new subscribers? Like if they get a discount, if they get somebody else to I sign haven't, up? you mean paid subscribers? Yeah, the paid like subscriber could program. get uh, like a discount if uh, they I, get I haven't tried else. that yet, but it's on my list. It's, it's going to come soon. Ah, OK. So, well, 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 no. Are you a paid subscriber? Do you want a discount? No. <laughs> <laughs> we can talk after. No, I'm just wondering about the concept. Yeah, I haven't tried that yet, but I, I will. One Jeez. Yeah, maybe. And then, and then I'll be having beer, so just come and talk to me. Who? Who has the best question? <laughs> <laughs> um, thanks for the story. It was great to hear. Thanks. Uh, great to listen. Um, did you have any other ventures before? So was it your first idea that you went for and focused on, or did you try something else? Um, yes, it was my first. The thing is, I didn't expect that the newsletter would be a product on its own. In fact, what I was trying to do at the start, I wanted to build like an email, like an online store selling real like goods. So I was just trying to have a newsletter like all those other e-commerce website and you know to keep like customers engaged and coming back. And after I got into the newsletter I realized that it could actually be a product in its own. So yes, it was my first venture but that's not what I was initially trying to do. Thank you. Awesome. Well I thought that was the last question. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> okay. So you talked about uh, how much time do you do your research, hmm. and that maybe I did not quite understand. So when in your research you talked about one font or one typeface or many typefaces, and then you offer one of them or yeah. Uh, sorry. Let me. Um, are my slides still here? So. In the newsletter, there's, a there's like six or seven different typefaces. So, well, maybe I won't show you after all, because I, yeah, whatever. Ouais, mais je vais repartir, je vais retour passer, tu vois. 
Um, yeah, so there are about like seven different typefaces and every typeface has a story. It has like, a, you know, design origins. Usually the design is based off like a f another typeface that was published years ago. And uh, so I have to read everything that the designer wrote about each typeface and then think about what I think is the most interesting about it and make a summary about each of those like seven, eight typeface. And this actually takes a lot of time. So does that answer your question? Yeah, I was wondering what, what was the value that your subscribers found out in your newsletter? What made them find it really interesting? So that's actually like your, yeah. your research and synthesizing everything that you find. Well, I think, to be honest, I think the most important aspect is that they get really good typeface that they haven't seen anywhere else yet. So it's like, I don't know, it's interesting and it's engaging. And then in the text description, I try to mention what I know is the most important for them. Like which languages are supported. If you're looking for a typeface for a project in, I don't know, in Greek, then you need to know if that typeface supports the Greek language, you know. Is that clear? Yeah. Yeah. For, yeah, for real? For <laughs> real. Okay, I don't know if it's good or not, but we'll deal with it. So I know you hand code, or at least um, you hand code the design of your emails. What's yeah. your email service provider that you use, and do you like them? Or? Uh, you, you mean to send out the newsletter? Yeah. yeah. I use Email Octopus. It's, uh, I'm assuming you were expecting MailChimp or something? No, I saw Tiny Letter earlier, so. Oh, I, never, I ended up never using Tiny Letter. Like, I just uh, use it for the initial sign-up page. And then I moved to Revue. Uh -huh. um, and then I used Revue for years. And then it got acquired by Twitter, and they shut it down. Um, so in the meantime, I switched to my very own design. And I now use Email Octopus to send out the newsletter. I've never heard of it. So what's kind no, of your but little it's sales You know what's good it? about it? It's pretty cheap. Like, it's way cheaper than MailChimp. Yeah. No, for real, because yeah. MailChimp, if you have 22,000 subscribers, is like 500 bucks a month. So, you know, I'd rather party with that money. <laughs> <laughs> thank you. Thank you. Thank you, everyone. Cool, thank you. Thank you, Naomi. <laughs> so I will try to reach my own slide now. Oh, yeah, now is the quiz, right? Uh, no. uh, not yet? Yeah, but not yet. <laughs> yeah, but not yet. Yeah, but not yet. Uh, let's... Yeah, it works. I don't remember the new order. Yeah, so the next one, Marty. We'll talk about nothing. It will be in French first. We'll talk about AI. This is the hot topic since like nine months now. Uh, it will be someone from the head, the dean of head in the Dean of Research at Head in Geneva, the design school. And I will talk about uh, AI on how it works with design and you know everything about the aspect of design with AA. So I think it may interest some of you. And maybe you know people that may be interested. It will be at Gamedia in Lausanne. It's next to um, uh, EPSIC, you know, this, this uh, quartier, this street. It will be the 6th of June. Uh, the open mind session, that's the moment that people can come here and just announce something they want to share with us. If you're looking for people, if you're hiring, if you're looking for a job, if you want more subscribers to your newsletter, I don't know, <laughs> whatever. This is the moment. I will give you the microphone so people online on the, and on the record will hear you. Please don't let me alone here. Yes. Oui, je vais parler en français aussi. Euh, donc, je suis Pierre, je travaille chez Antistatique, et puis on est en train de rechercher une ou un UX designer. Donc voilà, alors, trois ans d'expérience, un à deux jours de remote, on est présent à Lausanne, pas très loin d'ici, à Genève également. On fait des sites web, des interfaces web, des applications. Et voilà, vous pouvez soit venir me parler juste après, je ne vais pas rester très longtemps, donc euh, attrapez-moi rapidement. Et puis euh, sinon, il y a toutes les infos sur le site Antistatique. Net. Voilà. Et petit bonus, vendredi, euh, vendredi euh, Kevin chante chez nous euh, nu vrai? de temps en temps. Voilà. Non, jamais nu. Never naked. J'ai pas le droit. Ok. Uh, someone else? 
Uh, yeah, job track, obviously. Say for Okay. So thank you, Naomi, for your performance tonight. And thank you, Kevin and WebMardi, for coming here. So uh, I'm Daniel, the community manager here in JobTrack. So how to explain uh, our job? So in one hand, you have the companies. And in the other hand, you have the youth. And what we observe is that things are going in that direction. So we don't like it. So I don't know what about you, but I want to get paid uh, during my, for my pension. So our mission is to, uh, to, 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 to link them back. So we are providing here uh, trainings, uh, coaching, links between um, companies and youth, and, uh, and even events uh, like uh, tonight. So re regarding IT stuff. So we try to solve an issue that you all know is um, the lack of workforce uh, in IT field. So as uh, Pierre-Georges, uh, you, you mentioned. So our goal is not to increase salary, is not to go abroad, and we don't want to give up. So we focus on youth and in apprenticeships. So the thing is, they come here in Lausanne, JobTrek, and they are trained here one year for free. And then they continue their apprenticeships, second year, third year, and fourth years, in the companies, in your companies. So if you want to train them, if you want to, if you aim to transfer knowledge to the next generation and get paid during the pension, so don't hesitate to contact me or my colleagues here, Noé, can you stand up, please? So you can speak with him all the technical stuff. I have uh, an economics background, so I cannot answer. <laughs> and you can speak with me for the mission, our mission, our goal, and uh, our culture, and things like that. So thank you for coming again, and welcome to JobTrack Lausanne. Thank you. Does anybody else want to? Please. Not even. So much people want to talk tonight. May I use your browser? Sorry? May I use your browser? Oh, yeah, you. Um, Hi, guys. Um, cool to be here. First time uh, comer. And very was very good talk. I really liked it. Um, I work actually for a startup here in Lausanne. But uh, that's not what I wanted to present now. I wanted to present my side project. Uh, thanks. Yes. So. If you guys are into um, analog photography, um, together with my friend, we developed this, uh, I think that's the URL. Uh, we developed this uh, mobile app, and um, it's for um, letting um, recreational analog photographers develop their photos at home. So if you, are, if you are into design, actually my friend is a UX designer as well, and a lot into fonts. Um, so, just wanted to, to say that uh, if you are into analog photography, we present you with uh, cool timers on how to um, 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 develop your own pictures. Uh, and so you can read our guide, and, and if you want, you can also write us an email and we can help you out. Um, it's just a bit funny to speak about it now because right, right now, at Today, actually, Apple took down the app down because I didn't pay the um, developer 100 euro, uh, you know, 100 francs uh, a year. So I need to pay it to be back up, but the Android app still works. Uh, so, um, yeah, so that's about me. Darkus, uh, yeah, you can, you can download us for free, actually, now. So, thank you. Thank you. Ah, vous voyez pas encore les slides. Nobody else anywhere? Anyone else? So let's continue with the next slides. If it works, I hope it works. It will work. It works. So, oh yes, we are looking for people to help us. Like I said before, for example, even facilitators or someone that help us, you know, um, placing shares. Um, making the apparel of it as helping us just to set up the venue. For example, this is one of the roles we are looking 
people for. So if you are interested for this role or any other role, just come back to me or, or Justine, Nelson, anybody from the WebMRD. Um, well, we're more than glad to explain you what we may need from you. Follow us on Instagram if you don't already follow us. We need people to follow us. And we post the photos of tonight just as you just did. And we post also many other stuff about the events. And we announced the event on Instagram too. And it's free. <laughs> uh, if you don't follow us on YouTube also, uh, if you can support us, it will be awesome. We post every videos that we did like tonight on the, on the YouTube. And you already, already also have access to the live stream. So if you can come here, you can access live directly, and you can ask a question on the live screen, and the speaker can answer it. And we have a newsletter, free <laughs> newsletter. Uh, yeah, you can find the link on the website too. Don't leave this slide here. If you don't, yeah, if you're not into having social me social network, you don't want to have an account on Meetup, just subscribe to the newsletter to receive the next event. We don't spam people. We don't give you email to people, not even to sponsors. It's just for us. So feel free for that. Let's talk about the Kahoot now. I will try to explain it in English. It will be hardcore for me. Uh, Kahoot is the game we will play. We have three gifts tonight. I will present you the